All right, Alexander, let's uh, go over the uh, the situation in Ukraine, and uh, let's first talk about how things are on the ground, the, the military situation, um, up to the point that we can actually discuss what's going on um, on the ground with accuracy, because there is a lot of fog of war. But, um, you know, we, we have seen uh, a lot of different maps coming out, <laughs> trying to, to figure out what the situation is in Ukraine. But... Um, there is one significant map that did come out, and it did come out from the Russian state media. And I know that a lot of people's reaction will be, oh, well, it's a map from the Russian state media, so it must be bogus. And um, I think a lot of people are misunderstanding the uh, importance of the Berve Canal, the first channel, actually putting this map on TV. And I would like you to clarify the importance of that, because... A lot of people think that Russian state media is putting out maps every single day and on every show, and that's just not the case. And it also confirms the progression of things as we have seen them uh, move in this military uh, operation over the past uh, 11, 12 days. So let's get into that, and then we can uh, talk more about uh, some other issues with regards to uh, Ukraine, Russia, Lavrov meeting the foreign minister of Ukraine as well. That's significant. And uh, perhaps we can wrap it up with some uh, talks about the, the sanctions. Nord Stream 1, they're talking about Nord Stream 1 perhaps going offline. I can't confirm it, but there's a lot of talk about that. So anyway, let's get uh, let's let's kick this off with uh, right. that map, that map. Indeed. Now, that map is actually a, a, a critically important event because, I mean, the point to understand is that the Russian media, now, Pervy Canal, first channel, is Russia's biggest me, uh, uh, t terrestrial TV station. I mean, and it's state run and it's official. Now, as you absolutely rightly say, they do not publish maps of the military operation. In fact, the military, the Russian military, are extremely careful to say very little about the conduct of the military operation. Now, this particular map, which has just been published, um, I think it was published yesterday, shows that the Ukrainian army in eastern Ukraine, the army, the Ukrainian army in the Donbass is now is now encircled. And um, this follows news reports that an important town called Iziun has been largely captured, not entirely captured, but largely captured by the Russian military, which essentially snaps the cauldron, as the Russians like to refer it, shut. Now, the cauldron is this concept the Russians have. You encircle an army, you cut off its supplies, you make it impossible for entire formations to leave, you then heat up the cauldron inside, you, you make life difficult for the soldiers, the military units inside, until they do one of two things. Either the army disintegrates, either there's, either, you know, there's a full-scale collapse, or alternatively, there is some kind of negotiated surrender. So that's what a cauldron is. Now, we have been getting reports from all sorts of people on the ground, or you know, or people with contacts on the ground. We've got all kinds of informal information from some for some time from people who are in familiar with this situation in eastern Ukraine, that this cauldron around the Ukrainian army in Donbass, which is the biggest part of the Ukrainian army, was developing. And they, all kinds of maps were being produced, but these were all informal maps by these people giving some ideas of how this uh, cauldron was evolving. The point is that Russian state media, the uh, uh, Pervy Canal First Channel, Publishing a map like this is the first official confirmation from the Russians, from the Russian authorities, that this cauldron now exists. They would not have published this, in my opinion, if I'm absolutely sure of this, if this had not actually been authorized from the highest levels. Now, when I say the highest levels, you must understand that this will have gone through layer upon layer of discussion within the Russian defense and security apparatus. So it will have been discussed by the general staff, by the Russian Ministry of Defense. It will have been referred to the Security Council, the Russian Security Council, all this layer of officials and institutions 
that have to approve this thing before it's published on First Channel. Now, the people who it is informing are Russians. <laughs> it's important to say Perfect Canal is not widely viewed outside Russia. So it is published, it is shown to Russians themselves. Russians are a, a, a nation who are extremely well versed on military matters. I mean, bear in mind, you know, lots of Russians serve in the army or have served in the army. This is a well-informed public on these sort of things. So for that reason, I think we can say, take this map as authoritative and it confirms that there has been an encirclement of the main Ukrainian force in Donbass. Right. Um, what does that mean? What exactly does that mean that uh, this force has been encircled? Right. And, uh, not only for the East, but what does it mean for the general uh, plan or the belief of this plan that uh, the Russians are going to um, create some sort of, um, no, for lack of a better word, uh, a, a, a new Russia, Novorossiya, cut out of the east from the Dnieper all the way to the east, and that's going to be this uh, this this new uh, entity, this new block. Yeah, and uh, there may be a buffer zone in the west. We, we don't. We'll discuss the west in a bit. We, but exactly. What does this mean exactly. These, uh, exactly. Now, these, I, 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 you have this cauldron in place now. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing to say, and this is a point which, again, we've been hammering away at in program after program, the Western media attention has been on what's been going on in Kiev and Kharkov, two cities which the Russian military have not sought to storm. Now, we've discussed many times why this is the case, but this is not an Iraq 2003 situation where the Russian military moves into Kiev, overthrows the government, arrests Zelensky, like, you know, Saddam Hussein was arrested, and um, he's then put on trial, and a new, entirely new political system is substituted in his place. The Russian approach is different, and that is to focus on the main army of the enemy, and if you are familiar with military history and military philosophy, you will know that this has been very much the tradition within Russian military history. You make the other side's army your primary target. This comes from 19th century thinking. You can trace it all the way back to Clausewitz and the influence he's had on Russian military thinking. So... The Russian forces outside Kiev and Kharkov are there to exert political pressure on the government in Kiev and also to prevent, no doubt, reinforcements being sent to the east. But the major focus of the fighting, far away from where the media is, the Western media are based, has always been against this large grouping of Ukrainian troops in Donbass. And those represent the best part of the Ukrainian army. In fact, the, far and away, the biggest part, the best part of the Ukrainian army. And that's where the real fighting has taken place. Now, if this grouping is destroyed, either because it surrenders or because it disintegrates or whatever, that then frees the rest of the Russian army to move essentially unopposed, through large areas of central and eastern Ukraine. And they are now, because there would not be a Ukrainian army to resist them, and at the same time, of course, their own forces would be essentially intact. So that would enable the Russians to consolidate their military control over all territories east of the Dnieper River. The Dnieper River is the river that divides Ukraine. And by the way, Kiev itself is located on the Dnieper River. So that's the purpose of this. Uh, that's the importance of this operation. It means that the Russians, once they've defeated this army, they can occupy without too much resistance 
the remaining part of eastern Ukraine, including the south area, the southern areas in, around the coast, um, without facing too much resistance. Now, the question then is, are they going to stop there? Are they going to move further west? Uh, we, we'll, we'll discuss that in a moment. But the important thing to say is that as they are doing this, and again, we've discussed this in many programs, they are simultaneously negotiating with the Ukrainian government. And the reason they're doing that is because they want whatever political structures they take, they create in place of the original Ukrainian authority, they want those political structures to obtain some degree of legitimacy, to some extent internationally, but first and foremost in Ukraine itself. So they would prefer a negotiated settlement with the Ukrainian government of this war. And that also is why they are focusing on the army in the east. Because once that army is destroyed, the Ukrainian government itself knows that it has lost its major force that provides it with the capacity to wage defensive action. So if you approach this in this much more political way, which is where, the way the Russians do, you, you can start to see how all the pieces fall into place. And the fact that Pervy Canal is now publishing this map tells us, as it, is exp as it is intended to tell most Russians, that the cauldron is now closed and that they are, in fact, progressing steadily towards their political objective. Yeah, and this and the map publication from the state media follows after uh, Putin said that the demilitarization part of this operation, remember, it's demilitarization, denazification. He said the demilitarization is almost complete. And we've heard much of uh, the Security Council, the Russian Security Council, and many Russian officials say that the demilitarization part is near completion. So every everything is starting to fall into place. And Anyone that looks at the map can see, you know, this this border that is shaping up, which is this border. Uh, maybe you could say a little west of the Dnieper, going all the way down and almost connecting in a way to Transnistria. Yeah. And uh, yes. and going a little westwards to Odessa, yes. which, by the way, yes. Odessa now appears to be another cauldron that's formed. Yes. So the question becomes then, what is to to be of this rump, uh, landlocked? portion of Western Ukraine, given the fact that Blinken has come out with uh, comments, I believe it was Face the Nation that he made these comments, where he has said, pretty much to paraphrase him, I'm green lighting uh, aircraft to go in there and and uh, EU partners in and around that area, more specifically Poland, to pretty much get involved. That was... Yes. Yes, that was the gist of his uh, of his response. We're green lighting Poland and anybody else to uh, to get involved in this conflict, and it raised a lot of alarm bells. Uh, how do you see things unfolding in the West? Well, I mean, the, the 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 Russian reaction to that immediately was that if anything like that happens, they will construe it by any country that actively becomes involved as an act of war. And I'm getting increasingly in the increasing sense that even hardline governments like those in Poland, I say hard line, I mean very supportive of Ukraine, uh, are, are looking at this and they're saying to themselves, we are not going to go there. This is not what we're going to do. We're not going to take on the Russians in Ukraine itself. And I, I, I'm even starting to get the sense that some East European governments are cooling on the whole insurgency idea. But the fact that Blinken, who comes across to me um, as, together with the rest of the State Department team, as the ultimate hardliner in this. He's the person and he's the, his team, you know, Victoria Newland, all of those people, they're the people who've been driving this crisis, who've been pushing relentlessly for the most hardline positions to be taken. The fact that they're talking in this way the fact that they're talking about sending fighter jets and all those sort of things, green lighting, prodding, if you like, 
the European nations to take these steps suggests is another reason for me to think that they are getting intelligence that the situation in Ukraine is becoming militarily unsustainable, that in fact this military position of the Ukrainian government is about to collapse or is in the process of being collab of, of collapsing. And that's, I think, what the Blinken thing was all about. You've also perhaps got to look at the Ukrainian side of things. And it's interesting to see how, again, the Ukrainians, having taken very hard line up to very recently, seem to be trying to find some kind of way out. Now, we've discussed on our programs humanitarian corridors, this Russian concept of humanitarian corridors. We've explained how it's based to a great extent on what happened in Syria. There was problems with setting up some of those humanitarian corridors, and many people thought that would never come into effect. We said in programs that this is exactly what happened in Syria as well. There were delays, there were problems, but eventually, faced with the overwhelming logic of the situation, they would come into effect. And lo and behold, as it's beginning to look, as it's in fact, I'm sure, is looking as if the military situation in eastern Ukraine is now turning decisively against the Ukrainians, we suddenly see humanitarian corridors appearing and uh, we're getting reports now this morning that civilians are indeed being evacuated from these cities. Now, let me repeat again, the purpose of humanitarian corridors, as the Russians trial them in Syria, is not just to get civilians out of the cities, it is to get Ukrainian troops who are stationed in those cities to lay down their, their arms, their heavy weapons, and to withdraw from those cities without at the same time being taken prisoner. So it, it, it's a way, if you like, of winkling Ukrainian troops out of places like Kharkov, Sumy, Chernigov, and the rest, without having massive battles in these places, which could cause huge civilian damage, destroy the, the infrastructure, do all the very things that the Russians at the moment seem to be anxious to avoid. So the fact that the Ukrainians are doing that suggests, as I said, that they're starting to have concerns. And the fact that Kuleba, their up to now very hardline foreign minister, is now meeting with Lavrov in Turkey, maybe a further sign of movement um, from the Ukrainians. And this morning, we've had statements from Zelensky himself, who it must be said changes his position almost by the hour. But he's talking now uh, again about uh, finding security guarantees for Ukraine outside NATO. And he's also talking about looking for ways to settle the issue of the status of Crimea and Donbass. So all the kind of things that the Ukrainians up to now had refused to discuss, Zelensky seems to be saying that they might be willing to discuss. So that's the trend at the moment. We can't say it's going to end in a peaceful settlement. We can't say that. But one, what we're describing in this program is the Russian strategy. And you see how all the pieces are starting to fit into place and how uh, they're starting to take the steps in eastern Ukraine with the army there. They're pursuing the negotiation track. They're pursuing the humanitarian corridor tra tra track. They're doing all of these things all at the same time with the ultimate objective, which is the political objective, of destroying Ukraine's military infrastructure and capacity. That's the army, its technical facilities, its air bases, its rocket facilities, its all those things, its tank factory in Kharkov, it's been destroyed apparently. All, all of that, and at the same time, pushing for a negotiated solution, which will make sure that Ukraine never joins NATO.
Yeah, uh, we've been hammering this point home for, for a while now, and you have specifically been hammering this point home for a while, which is the fact that diplomacy and the military operation, the way it worked in Syria and the way it's working now, it's very much a dance. Sometimes yeah. the diplomacy is leading, sometimes yeah. the military operation is leading, but they're working together yes. towards a common yes. goal. And that is how the, yes. the Russians have approached this conflict in much the same way they approached Syria. Now, we're not saying that Syria is exactly the same as no. Ukraine. I mean, there's, there's no. big differences in each, and and, and there's very distinct yeah. differences yes. in uh, each case. But the overall general uh, strategy holds for both uh, conflicts. Yes. What does it tell you, though, that as the Zelensky government, and I say that very loosely, the Zelensky government, because I think we can all safely say that Zelensky isn't calling the shots by no means. But anyway, this this government is um, softening up its position with regards to the, uh, the, the guarantees that the Russian government wants. And Russia's spelled out these guarantees. I mean, they're very specific about it. You know, recognize uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, recognize Crimea, uh, denazify, and... Um, Put in your constitution that yeah yeah that you're uh, putting your constitution that you will be neutral yeah. you know codify yeah. that. What does it tell you though that it seems the, the Zelensky government is ready to do three of those four things? It's ready yes. to recognize Crimea. It's ready to recognize the Donbass. It's it seems it's, it seems like it's ready to denazify whatever that that really means. And, and I'm sure the Russian government has a very specific idea as to a specific I, plan absolutely. as to what that means. Yes, but. They still will not budge on NATO. Yeah. Which is but the easiest will... one to figure no, out. No, I mean, no, it's, it it's the easiest of all. Just go to I your know, constitution. We're going to be I neutral. Know. No NATO, and that's that. But they I will know. not budge on it. What does that tell you? No, I know. I mean, a, number, a number of things. Firstly, I, th I think the first thing to say is that they've not said that they will agree to do all those other things. They said they're prepared to talk about it. And that's a huge difference. Right. Okay, I mean, yeah. it, but yeah. having said that, they are prepared to talk about it. And. That is interesting and it's important because they've consistently refused even to float the possibility of talks on these issues up to now. But the fact that they are standing so hard on NATO, to my mind, shows what this conflict ultimately Going all the way back to 2014, going back even further still to the Orange Revolution that happened in Ukraine in 2004, it tells you what this thing has always been ultimately about. It's been about this attempt by a political faction in Washington. I'm using choosing my words very carefully and very precisely because I don't want to suggest that the United States, everybody in the United States is united behind this. But a political faction in Washington brought up on doctrines from Zbigniew Brzezinski, Wolfowicz, Paul Wolfowicz, all of these people have been trying for decades to bring Ukraine integrated into the Western military and defence structures, in other words, into NATO, believing that that would weaken forever, Russia forever. The Russians see that as an existential threat, which is why they've responded in the way that they have. And the fact that the Ukrainians, who are still obviously heavily influenced by this political faction in the United States, the fact that they are reluctant to budge from that position about NATO shows that this political faction has still not given up on that plan and still has levers in Kiev that it's prepared to pull. All right, so uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, Nord Stream 1. Um, this is an interesting story, and it is floating around that uh, the Russians may uh, tinker with Nord Stream 1. <laughs> you know, it's, it's incredible stuff. We have the oil embargo, which it seems like this hysteria is just taking over the, the collective West, the United States. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, doesn't matter. They're all pushing for an oil embargo, and they're trying to get the Europeans on board. That was another statement from Blinken, who said that, you know, yes, we want to uh, have an oil embargo on Russia, but we want our European partners to to agree to it. Okay. Uh, that would... I, I don't know what, what Europe is trying to do to it. So it's like, a, a, like Europe is trying to 
purposefully self-destruct, it seems, uh, with the help of the United States. Um, and you have, uh, so, so you have the oil embargo thing, you have the Nord Stream, uh, one thing that's floating around, uh, wheat prices, I saw nickel prices, uh, oil prices, everything is just going through the freaking roof. And um, I saw a list as well, Alexander, this is floating around again, that Russia has actually now um, identified the countries that were hostile to them. And um, this is kind of the first step towards their retaliation. And I mean, they've, they've created the list. It includes all of the European Union countries and some other countries as well. So it looks like the Russians slowly, slowly, as they solidify the situation, the military situation in Ukraine, as that comes more and more under control, that they're going to start to look at their sanction retaliation in more detail. What's the situation? Yes, indeed. Indeed. Now, the comment about Nord Stream 1 actually is official. It came from the Russian Deputy Prime Minister, a man called Novak, who is in charge of energy policy. Now, what happened, and, you know, yesterday, by the way, was an absolutely wild day on the markets. And what made it so was that incredible interview that uh, Blinken give, gave, in which he floated the idea of an oil embargo. Not just the United States stopping purchases of Russian oil, but the entire West stopping purchases of Russian oil. In other words, an attempt to close off the entire Russian oil industry. Anyway, he gave this interview that caused oil prices to explode. It also then began to affect all prices of every other commodity as well, including nickel prices. And incredibly and bizarrely, instead of the hardliners in the West easing off, even as commodity prices are exploding underneath them. We got reports that the European Commission is now cobbling some kind of plan together to try to wean off uh, Europe from Russian gas, 60%, replace 60% of it within a year. Now, I don't think anybody who has any knowledge of this believes that can happen. But, I mean, it, it gives you some idea of how unreal the whole thing is. And, of course, that's had a further effect on uh, uh, commodity prices. So we got this wild ride yesterday. Now, over the course of it, the German government, which is incredibly weak and whose weakness is largely responsible for the fact that we are in this crisis, the fact that Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, has proved a, a broken reed, the fact that the Green ministers are incompetent and inexperienced and pathetic, Anyway, it panicked and said that it opposed an import ban, an, an oil import ban into the EU. Um, but of course, it also had previously said that um, a few weeks ago about SWIFT. It said, you know, that it opposed a SWIFT ban. So, of course, nobody believes them now <laughs> because um, they caved on SWIFT. The EU Commission is coming up with these ideas. Um, so people think, well, just as they caved on SWIFT, they're going to cave on the import ban, the oil import ban. And to twist the knife, Novak came along and said, look, if you're going to go down this route, then we are ready, we stand ready to switch off Nord Stream 1. We have every right to do so. After all, you terminated Nord Stream 2. So if you terminate Nord Stream 2 in that kind of way, we are able legally and morally to start taking retaliatory action. And that, of course, made uh, uh, the situation in energy markets and indeed general commodity markets even wilder. Now, I, you know, I, I, I have to say that people have taken leave of their senses. We have a small group of people in the United States and in Britain and in, the, and in Brussels, in London, Washington and Brussels, who are, in my opinion, um, viscerally anti-Russian to a degree that is just, I, I mean, I, it's shaken me. I, I, I have to say, I mean, I always understood that these people were ideologues and uh, dangerous people, but the, the, the lack of logic in this, um, I, I, I have to say, has astonished me. Their willingness to propel the entire world 
into an uncontrolled recession. I, I, I mean, I, I, never, I never expected to see it. But they are still driving this. And you still see that there doesn't seem to be, within the West, an organised pushback against it. Now, I don't know where this is going to head. I don't know where this is heading. But um, the Russians, as you rightly say, have published now this list of countries which they consider unfriendly. They are the countries that have imp imposed sanctions upon them. That means that they are the countries that they can impose retaliatory sanctions against. One country, which is Japan, has already been spooked by this, because remember, Japan is very heavily dependent on um, energy and commodity imports. So they are extremely upset about this, and they complain to the Russians about the fact that they've been placed on this list, and they say they're not really unfriendly towards Russia at all. But of course, they did impose the sanctions. So you would have thought that in this situation, which is doing so much damage and which is propelling us into such a deep recession, people in the West would be prepared to take stock. But this disastrously weak leadership that you see in Europe doesn't seem to have the ability to climb, to get off this escalator. I, mean, I should say that I think it's now widely accepted that when they went against the Russian central bank and they announced the SWIFT sanctions, the objective was to trigger a bank run in Russia. And you remember, you got all of those pictures of people, you know, the ATMs. The queues didn't actually look particularly different from what I normally see. But, you know, th there was a hope that this would trigger a bank run. Well, the Russian authorities managed to get that under control. So having failed there, they still want to go forward and now do something even bigger, you know, uh, 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 even as what they're doing soars the branch upon which of the tree upon which the entire world economy sits now sooner or later i hope reason will prevail and we'll start to see a road back but at the moment i have to say that there is no sign of it before we end this video do you have any indication what this eu plan is that they're going to get rid of uh, russian gas in, in one year do yeah you, well, what's this yeah, I, what's I, this plan and why I, didn't they just do this many many years ago i mean if it's that easy I, I, well, indeed. Yeah. Well, indeed. I mean, it's not it's not easy at all. I mean, it, it, buy more liquefied natural gas. I mean, there's limits to capacity. There's 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 fundamental capacity limits. You just can't get over there. Uh, um, um, use more coal, and of course, build more windmills. I mean, you know, it it it, it, it really comes down to that. I mean, it, it simply isn't. To me, it's not a plan. It's just somebody, it's something that somebody has written off on the back of an envelope. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a plan of any kind. But the trouble is, and I say this again, given the political leadership in the West, in Europe, is led by amateurs, complete amateurs, I mean, it's possible that they might mistake this for a plan, in which case we're all in serious trouble. Oh, I mean, we already we are really in serious, serious trouble. I mean, trouble. We're what, seeing that. What has happened? What and what has happened? I mean, it, 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 I think it is impossible now to avoid a recession. I mean, I, I, I think even if everything was reversed tomorrow, which it won't be, but even if everything was reversed tomorrow, we would still get a recession and we would still get a serious inflation spike. But having said that, we're in a bad situation, we're in a deep hole, and we're digging, we're digging even ever more frantically in the hope that, you know, we can achieve something in Russia, you know, the, we could achieve, you know, the collapse of the Russian economy, and change. Putin's yeah. overthrow, and we can do this in the next few weeks, regime change, and we can do this in a few weeks. I mean, it's increasingly looking, it's looking increasingly unlikely that's going to happen, as I said, uh, um, Anybody who knows Russia would know that this is wildly improbable. But, you know, that seems to be the idea. And it, it, it's been pushed now to the point of destruction. Our destruction, not theirs. Yep. Uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor actually was on Tucker Carlson. He said the same exact thing.
that the U.S. and Europe is going to pay the price for all of this, not Russia. I thought it was interesting coming from from Tucker Carlson and Colonel Douglas McGregor. Anyway, yeah, re regime change in reverse is, I think, <laughs> what we're going to see. <laughs> anyway, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there, everybody. Uh, the Duran.locals. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. there. The Duran.locals.com. Uh, and if you're watching this on Rumble, you will find a link up top, a little red button, which will take you to our Locals page as well. And the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care. There's the mug. Take care. <laughs>